Welcome to my latest YouTube video. Today, I am discussing the mother wound and childhood trauma with my dear friend, my respected colleague, Rick Belden. Some of you already know, because Rick and I have done a video together, that um, Rick uh, not only wrote the introduction for my second book, The Human Magnet Syndrome, The Codependent Narcissist Trap, but his friendship over the years has had a profound impact on me, the development of my ideas and my personal recovery. Plus, he's just a really nice guy. So, Rick, it's so nice to see you again. Well, it's good to see you too. But before we begin, I want people to know that Rick is an incredible, perhaps one of the best life coaches I know, who has a practice in Austin, Texas. Check him out, rickbelden.com and find out about his work. Um, I, I very rarely endorse coaches. He's not only the best, but he really gets this attachment trauma issues or what um, we're gonna discuss it. Uh, what's it called? Mother wound is the terminology that I use. Tell, tell the viewers, what is a mother wound? As I always tell everybody, I'm not a psychotherapy professional. I'm not a clinician. Uh, I work primarily uh, out of my own life experience and the life experience of others uh, that I've uh, observed and been around. Uh, I spent a lot of years in uh, support groups with other men, and uh, so I've uh, had firsthand experience watching people uh, surface their inner material and work with it and learn how to, uh, to frame it uh, so that they can move forward with it. You know, what is it that drives your perceptions and your beliefs and your actions and your feelings? Uh, what is it that uh, gives you the sense of what your identity is and who you are based on all of uh, what you feel and perceive and your behaviors and so forth? Because I know in my experience, and I think it's true for a lot of people, a lot of what we consider to be our nature, uh, our innate nature, our personality that we we're born with is in some ways kind of the product of a whole lot of mysterious stuff that's under the surface that we're not really fully aware of if we're aware of it at all. And part of that set is the um, unacknowledged, unidentified, unresolved trauma uh, that we bring into adulthood from our childhood circumstances, whatever they may have been. We see the world very similar vantage point. Um, the way that he works with his clients and the way that I work with my clients are that they come to us with layers upon layers of explanations uh, for who uh, they are that they might not necessarily see or know about. And not only do we help them see what's invisible, but help them understand these forces, identify them, help them when possible, resolve them, let them go. And I believe this idea of the mother wound, which I'm like really curious about and would love to hear you talk more about it, is a primary force um, that is responsible for the development of adult psychological problems, adult mm -hmm. psychopathology, whether mm -hmm. it's the, the personality disorder of the narcissist or it's a codependency or the self-love deficit disorder. And we don't really need to know all the exact specific words, but we have to understand that these earlier events, these earlier relationships were so um, powerfully connected to the, the creation of this, of the future adult's personality. I'm gonna read the definition that I use. A mother wound may be thought of as an injury to the psyche of a child resulting from significant dysfunction or disruption in a relationship with the mother. In some cases, it is a result of a mother's absence or unavailability due to death, illness, adoption, or other circumstances that dramatically separate the child from the mother. But more typically, a mother wound is a complex of injuries to the child's psyche received over many years, often as a result of the mother acting, consciously or not, out of her own woundedness. One of the most severe types of psychic wounding occurs when the child's primary function in the relationship is to be used by the mother to meet her own narcissistic needs. Now, this is a working definition that's my own that I came up with uh, out of my own experience and out of my experience in reading, research, and observation of other people. 
but this is important to me, Ross, is because, um, I, you know, I came out of a, a very a highly dysfunctional family situation uh, with all sorts of neglect and abuse and trauma and all sorts of insufficiencies, you know, in terms of uh, parenting. Uh, it was, my father was angry and distant and scary. Uh, my mother was, uh, I saw her and she conditioned me to see her as the good one. So entering adulthood, and, and as I entered my 30s, as I began to realize that my, my life didn't work, I started to see a counselor, I started to do some men's groups and some men's work, and immediately my dad was like the target. Mm -hmm. He was the one that caused all the problems. Mm -hmm. So I started out in what I would call my father wound, which was right. a very comfortable place to start out. It's a very comfortable place in our culture, in my opinion, for anybody to start out. Uh, because uh, teen off on dad is a safe thing to do. Uh, but what I'd like to add is that if, if we have two parents, and so what we're talking about is attachment trauma. Yes. And we have uh, two parents in their own role. I, I, the terminology I use are um, there is a pathological narcissist and SLD or codependent parent. And the combination of forces uh, severely harm their children. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guess or suggest that the reason so many people first talk about the father wound, it's easier to talk about the person who was aggressive to you, that whose harm was overt and easily to um, identify. What, what, what is the other uh, aspects for why people start off talking about the father wound before they get to the mother wound? I think there is a, I think there's an instinctive sort of uh, response as well as a, a culturally conditioned response that mothers are to be protected. So, so, yeah. you, so for you in your own personal experience, um, your, your, your personal journey, your, your recovery journey was to talk about your, your father wound. So, and not just talk about it, but actually actively engage in it. Mm -hmm. Write about it, do, uh, you know, do emotional release work. As you said, talk about it, really mm -hmm. focus on it, really get into it. You know, tell him at, at a point when I needed to separate from the family system so that I could heal and, be, and survive. Uh, and I wrote a letter to my dad and to my mom. The letter to my dad was just like, you know, hey, I've had enough of you. You did this. I saw you did all that kind of stuff. My mom was like, hey, mom, do you know about codependency? You know, it was friendly. Uh, You're still so, protect, you were still protecting her. And, and so, it sounds like not even conscious of her malignant or, or harmful impact on your emerging um, psyche as a child. Absolutely. And completely unwilling to go there. Uh, and what made me, what began to open the door for me was when I had multiple relationship failures with women and I came to understand that that was a collaborative venture. Right. A relationship failure is a collaborative venture. It is not the result of one person being bad and one person being good. That caused me to re-examine my concept of how my parents behaved, what their impact was, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that started to open the door. Uh, and actually, what really opened the door to mother wound work, number one, was I had worked my father wound down to a level where a lot of stuff was taken care of and resolved and it wasn't so hot. And I was like, why am I still having problems in my life? You know, uh, what, what else is going on? And then I started to have some dreams. Uh, and the, I, I sought out a counselor who helps do uh, dream work. Mm -hmm. And she very gently... And she's a woman, which is, that was helpful because I, I sought out a, a, a surrogate mother right. and uh, she would very gently point out during dreams, well, what do you think about the way your mother's showing up in this dream? I'm like, I don't know. Uh, she's okay, I guess, you know, and gradually I st my mind started to open up, you know, with all those factors that I just listed. And also, Ross, I started to notice the way that I felt after I talked with my mom on the phone. Uh, not just immediately after, but for days afterward, uh, I would be in a, a very sour space and feeling very unkind toward myself and uh, feeling very frustrated. And then I started to notice how frustrated and angry I felt while I was talking to her. Uh, so eventually the, that, that sort of, you know, that, that kind of line between what's conscious and unconscious. Mm -hmm. This area of my life, it dropped down and down and down to where the stuff that was unconscious was now I was aware of it. Uh, so then I knew there's something here that I need to tend to. 
the reason that um, my clients protect one of their parents, uh, and, and, and in the case of this discussion, we'll say the mother, mm -hmm. uh, is because I think it's an innate, um, almost biologically determined function that a child needs to believe he or she is loved or lovable. And in the absence of love from both parents, um, it's going to choose the person that they're going to fantasize as being the loving, nurturing one. Yes. And, and that one is, in the case of this discussion, um, the mother. Mm -hmm. And I get into these conversations often with my SLDs because they, they glorify their codependent mother. And for, for that matter, it could be their father. Mm -hmm. um, but they want to say, well, she took care of us or he took care of us. He, he took us to our baseball games. He took us to the dance recital. You know, she hugged us and she told us we were perfect and lovable. They created this, um, this platform upon which they can place this idealized, fantasized vision of their mom so that they don't have to or wouldn't have to actually recall what happened, which was the mother or the father, but the mother, SLD, chose the narcissist over the children. She protected her husband, the father, as all SLDs do, they do everything and anything they can to, to fulfill the narcissistic needs of their partner. They lose themselves and the kids get lost. The kids get lost either through neglect, abuse, or just being around and observing the insanity. Mm -hmm. My hypothesis is, and, and I'd like to hear what you, what you think about it is, is in order to preserve the fantasy that at least one person loved them, they have to keep the, this fantasy role of the loving, nurturing mother alive, or they have to face the stark reality as if both of their parents, even their doting, um, loving SLD parent, um, were complicitous and in some ways equally responsible. What, what do you think? I think you're right on. And the one thing that I will add to that is uh, the same quote from John Sarno that I shared last time, which is that uh, the reason childhood things are a factor is because the unconscious has no sense of time. Right. So at some level, what you're talking about, if you're, you're talking about a, like a 45-year-old adult having right. to come to terms with the fact that, yeah, that parent I glorified wasn't really that good and they're actually part of the problem. Well, somewhere in there, there's a, there's a child that's horrified at the prospect of losing one good parent and having none. Right. And I think that uh, when you talk about forces, I think the, I think that, uh, that, you know, that child who is trapped in time and believes I still need this person. Right. That's a force. Yeah. And, and that's, that's the force of what I call in my work, the trauma child. Mm -hmm. the SLDs, people with self-love deficit disorder are that way because of the attachment trauma, because of the mother and the father wound or the combined wound. You carry that inside of you, but somehow you have to not remember it because to remember it is to understand how invalid, how unimportant, how um, easily it was to neglect and hurt you and not even have the mother or the, the, the SLD parent protect you. So we ignore reality so we can keep this narrative that gives us this fake belief that we had something good. And, and, I, and I want yeah, to... We still need it right now because of that part of us that's still trapped in time. Ex explain that more. Well, you know, in, in the work that I do with people, one of the things that I, I try to help people do is identify and recover aspects of themselves that were lost along the way. You know, in, in my experience, in my, the way I conceive of things and my perception and what I've observed, you know, we think, you know, I'm 61 and I think I'm 61 all the time and that's all that's going on. Right. But, you know, there's a five-year-old in there. There's a three-year-old. There's a 10-year-old. There's a 14-year-old. And, um, you know, they, they still have their unfulfilled agendas as well. And so, you know, one of the things I try to do with people is help them, you know, let's, let's identify that 14 year old and let's develop a, a, a dialogue, help you develop a dialogue with that part of yourself so that you can learn and understand 
what did not get fulfilled, what did not get resolved, because that is, that's one of the things that's driving you right now. And that's one of the things that's causing you problems right now, because you have a 14-year-old as a forceful presence. And if you've got an unhappy 14-year-old inside yourself that you're carrying around, then that presence is going to make itself known in your, in, in your life right now in real time. It's, it's so interesting, Rick. I mean, we talk a lot, but it's impossible for us to talk about everything that we do and what we think. But what you're reminding me and, and our viewers is that we are very aligned in the way we think because my theoretical and practical approach to solving self-love deficit disorder and getting to self-love abundance is to understand that it is caused by attachment trauma and that trauma is disconnected from our memory. It's mm -hmm. disassociated from it. it we're, it's repressed. And so there is, it's repressed and frozen at the time of the injury. And so I call, uh, excuse me, I um, explain to my clients that we carry our, our trauma child inside of us and she or and he is always there. We just have a hard time, if sometimes an impossible time, connecting to her. Mm -hmm. And so, and that is the basis for why I have these weekend intensive retreats or three day retreat where what the whole purpose is, is to through um, a, a myriad um, and mixture of, of activities, approaches, experiences is to connect to that child that you're talking about that really is running the show who they don't really know. And the other thing I want to say about, in particular, about this mother wound topic is that, you know, and we kind of alluded to this earlier, um, people often feel so protective of their mothers right. that they just don't want to go there because I don't want to harm her. I don't want to hurt her feelings. I'm supposed to look out for her. You know, this is a, this is a classic thing with children that have been, what's the term, parentified? Mm -hmm. uh, like from a young age, I know that my mom needs me to look out for her. So, so wait, 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 just one second. Let me explain to our viewers. Uh, a parentified child is a child who is, um, who is forced either um, overtly or passively to become a grown up, um, to take on adult responsibilities, to actually parent either the parent themselves or their siblings. Mm -hmm. It's an unnatural force that it has extremely um, dire and harmful repercussions on their psychological development. Because as a child, you're supposed to be the parented one. You're supposed to receive the parenting. But if a child finds safety and perhaps love and attention by being parental, they have to disconnect from their normal um, child world and adopt that of an adult. And that's unnatural and causes adult psychological problems yes yes and so that's another impediment to getting in there and looking at the mother wound to whatever extent you had it people think they are doing their moms a favor or they're looking out for them by not doing this work and <laughs> I, I i say they're wrong because and i'm going to talk about my case in particular i did not i was incapable of seeing my mom as a separate individual human being I felt without realizing it, without knowing it, I did not feel that we were separate people. Uh, and that honestly, Ross, I've never told you this, but a key moment in breaking through that was reading through some of your material. Oh. Uh, you had a, I'm going to find it so I, so I get this right. Okay. Uh, you, did, you have something on like cause of codependency and narcissism, how and why. And I ran across that material in, uh, I think it was January of 2016. And I was already uh, about six weeks maybe into some, the, I went really, really deep into this mother wound stuff, into the work, into the, the grieving. There was so much grief there that I just had never been able to approach before. Um, and, you know, grief work is hard for me. It's hard for a lot of men. Mm -hmm. And I guess I had to get pushed pretty hard in my life to get there. But the point is, that at the point when I saw the material uh, uh, on that YouTube video, the slideshow that you were sharing, um, somehow that shifted something in me. And I remember very specifically, I went out for a walk uh, along the uh, edge of the park, the trail down the street, 
And I swear to God, it was like people talk about an epiphany. All of a sudden, it just hit me. My mom and I are separate people. Right. Is that interesting? And I am not responsible for her feelings. I am not responsible for what happens to her. I, I, we're, I can't even put it into words. It was not an intellectual realization. It was one of those full body, uh, sudden, suddenly I know. Suddenly I realized it was complete. It was total and it changed everything for me. And it was a case of, I didn't even know what I didn't know. Right. I didn't know that that was going on. I didn't know that at the age of 58 or 59, I did not, I had no experience of myself as being a separate person. You know, first of all, thank you. Um, thank you for, um, um, for saying such um, um, sweet and kind things about my work. But, but, but I find it fascinating because your experience is what I try to do purposefully um, in the psychotherapy relationship. Mm -hmm. I try to trigger memories and feelings about what was, uh, what up until a moment in, time, um, in, in that moment was unacceptable. I try to facilitate people getting healthy enough so that they can remember the pain. And I say this all the time. It is an important, um, it is an important milestone in in someone's personal recovery, to be healthy enough to finally allow themselves to deal with the horrible grief and sadness and memories of abuse and neglect. So, yes. in your case, um, my uh, uh, what was it? The webinar. What which? What was that webinar called again? Uh, it was called. Uh, the cause of codependency and narcissism, how and why. And it's on YouTube. Um, that had the impact of taking this disassociated, repressed, forgotten material and bringing it forward. And I believe it's because you were ready and healthy enough to finally deal with the pain of the reality of your mother wound. I agree. Essentially, metaphorically, I had made my way up to the door. And right. that was the key to open the door. And then once I crossed the threshold, several things happened. Uh, I, I wound up doing a lot more grieving about my other relationships in the family. And I realized that the reason I had access to that material now is because my mother was the emotional gatekeeper. Right. Now, once I was able to move her aside, then all the other stuff came through. Now, here's the really great thing uh, in my experience about this. My relationship with my mother is much better now than it's ever been uh, because I don't, again, I have separated. I had never done the psychological separation from my mother. So right. now that I see the two of us as separate human beings, I realize it's like, oh, it's okay for me to have boundaries. Right. And it's okay for me to realize that she is not the person I wanted her to be. Right. She never will be. And that is just, that is so incredibly liberating. There's a sadness to it, and I had to grieve that too. But yeah. and, and ex to some extent, it's still ongoing, and maybe it always will be. But the point is that I wasn't doing her any favors by not doing that work. I wasn't. I was thinking. Part of me is thinking, "Oh, I'm protecting her." But the reality was that I was. I was doing the worst thing you can do to anybody, which is not allowing them to be who they are. Yeah, and and what I'll suggest is your mom and her well-being has no bearing on this decision because you were, um, in, in a sense, were gaslit. You were gaslit that your loyalty um, and protection of your mom not only guaranteed you this narrative that you had this loving parent, but it also required you to deny at any cost the harm that, uh, and the cost of, of, of being oblivious to really the real forces um, and the real impact of your mom's selfishness. Yes. And so you are, you are not only ready to face the truth, but in a way to break the psychological symbiosis. Because if we understand symbiosis in childbirth, the child, a child's umbilical cord is connected to uh, the vasculature of the mother, and they share blood, and they are of the same body. And um, in, in a psychological sense, you became strong enough to understand that this is not, and it has never been, an environment that's been good for you. She right. doesn't feed you or give you. She has been depleting you. 
And mm -hmm. in your moment of epiphany, in your moment of understanding, you knew you had to break free. And because of your, just because you're just this nice guy, and I know your goal is not to be mad at someone just to be mad at them, you just wanted to get better. So you were able, in your own empathy, it sounds like, to let your mom be the broken person she was, mm -hmm. but just be grateful for the fact that you weren't subject to the, the tyranny of your um, repressed memories and your denial. Mm -hmm. And the larger picture for me and maybe for other people is that the, you know, my model of intimacy was that I would sacrifice myself yes. for somebody else. And you and were, that and carries over into other situations that carry in over into the workplace or friendships, anything, right. you know? And, and so dependent SLD. Yeah. yeah. So that, that meant that not only did I change the definition of the relationship that I had with her, I changed the definition of the relationship I have with everybody in the outer world and with myself. Uh, and that is the primary thing that I want to do with people when I'm coaching is to help them repattern their relationships with themselves. To explain that more. It's fascinating. Um, and, but I have to say it's fascinating because we, we parallel in so many ways. We do it differently and we have different techniques and background. But I love the way, I love hearing you explain it because not only reinforces what I do, but it opens up my own understanding of how things can be seen and resolved from another perspective. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess the, 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 the way I would put it quickly and basically is that I, I've become very interested in my own case and in, in the case of clients that I work with in this idea of, you know, to what proportion of who you think you are is innate and what proportion of who you think you are is due to conditioning. Mm -hmm. The conditioning that other people, whether it's at home or at school in the culture, put on you or conditioning you put on yourself because you felt like this is the best option for me to survive and thrive at this point in my life under these circumstances. So when I talk about repattering your relationship with yourself, what I mean is let's examine those patterns of belief, perception, behavior, and action that result in the person that you think you are and to what extent is that really you and to what extent is that something that you can examine and modify so that you're more effective in your life and so that you have a more positive relationship with yourself because that's the only relationship that we have through our whole lives uh, that we can count on and if that one's not right then it's going to propagate out into all the other relationships that we have. So guys this is why I love doing videos with Rick. And uh, I know we're closing soon, but um, I don't have to say this guy's great. You just have to listen to him. Um, um, he's not a psychotherapist. He doesn't do what I do, but he does something that's equally important, that's equally impactful. And, and he gets to it. He gets to it because he authentically understands it from his own journey and his own work. So before, before I kind of wrap this up, Rick, um, I just want to first say thank you for a great man, and I cannot thank you enough on how you've um, influenced my personal recovery and my life. And now here's a curveball. You ready for it? Can you read that poem we talked about? And we can oh, yes. It? Sure. This is a poem that I wrote while I was uh, in the process of moving into my own mother wound and approaching it. Uh, it is before the experience that I talked about uh, where I had the big liberation and realized we were separate. And this is, uh, this will echo a lot of the things that I think Ross and I have, have said already during this discussion. Uh, this poem is called The Grief I Will Not Let Myself Feel. I've never grieved my first love, the one who brought me here, never cried for losing her, never shed a tear. The grief that I will not let myself feel for her occupies its own universe within me. It has its own culture, its own history, its own language, its own physics. It recreates itself automatically and repeatedly in the outer world. The grief I will not let myself feel for her is epic, mythic, immense as the Milky Way, but it's lost somewhere far inside me, like a ghost ship with a broken compass traveling in endless circles in a dense fog. 
The grief I will not let myself feel for her is buried in the safety of anger. I hold that anger tight in my teeth. I use it to try to plug the lifetime of holes she's left in my psyche, but the pain keeps leaking out. The grief I will not let myself feel for her is deep, profound, and frightening. It's the monster under the bed, the shark stalking the swimmer, the mugger waiting in a dark alleyway. It's a hydra tree with heads for leaves and tangled roots set like fish hooks in my embryonic heart. The mm. grief I will not let myself feel for her is locked up high in the tower of a castle with a drawbri drawbridge gate guarded by an infant. He guards that late gate with his life because he knows that my entry into the tower of unfelt grief means the end of her. And he's convinced he can't live without her and doesn't want to. That's brilliant. That is so brilliant. Oh my gosh. So can we end with you telling people how to get in contact with you? Yes. Uh, my legacy website uh, is rickbeldon.com. Ross mentioned that previously that has that's the that's the full archive of all the work written work video work podcasts and so forth that i have available uh, if you're interested in coaching my coaching site is rickbeldencoaching.com and uh, i offer a, a free 30 minute discovery session uh, which gives you the opportunity to tell me a little bit, bit about your situation and i do have a, another site now called men and the mother and that is a collection of all of, again, all of my writings specific to the mother wound uh, topic, as well as uh, videos and podcasts, as well as the other work that I've scoured the web to find uh, on that topic. It is specifically oriented toward men, but is not exclusive to women because uh, a lot of the material is going to resonate with women either for their own experience or the fact that they have boyfriends or husbands that they may be trying to understand. Thank you, guys. You guys, thank you for coming by and, um, and listening to uh, Rick and I.